Uh, so this final session um, is sponsored by NRAC Renewables, and we have Heather Miller here who will be speaking to us. Um, yes, I hope everyone enjoys it. I hope everyone has enjoyed Australian Renewable Fuels Week. Tentatively, we're looking at Sydney in February next year, so mark that. My ambition is to make renewable gas as sexy as we have made SAF in the last 12 months so that we have standing room only next year for renewable gas. So that's my KPI. I'm not sure the board will write that in as a KPI, but that's what I'm aiming for. Um, so thank you so much for your support and, and over to you, Heather. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, today we've got this fantastic panel who will we'll be talking about the essential role of a domestic biomethane industry. Um, as Shahana said, we've got a really good lineup this afternoon, so I'm, I'm really glad everyone made this session. Um, so first we'll up, we'll have Matt from Blue Scope Steel. Uh, that will be followed by Sina from APA Group. Um, then we'll have Brent from Gemina. Uh, that'll be followed up by Mike from Optimal, uh, Richard from Calfresh, which um, will then lead into Jared, who is from AGIG. Um, so I've just got a really brief introduction. Ooh, I didn't think I did that, but I'm not sure if anyone was here last year, but um, I gave a presentation on public perceptions about biomethane and biogas. And I thought it would just be interesting to see where we, where we were at, where we were at 12 months on um, to see you know, what's changed and, and check in. So just very quickly, uh, NRAC Renewables, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer there. We um, specialise in full EPCM of waste to energy plants, um, focusing on biogas in the Asia Pacific. Um, we were an equipment provider for the Malabar project, which Brent will um, discuss. And you can see there um, is a, that container on the right is um, currently in New Zealand. So that is the um, biogas upgrading unit for uh, a site for first gas, which is um, upgrading organic waste um, and injecting into the gas grid. So that's the first project in New Zealand that will inject um, biomethane into the local gas network. So, where we were in 2023, um, I think it's best shown with imagery. So technology, we've got the technology. Um, capability, awesome, kicking goals there. We certainly had the capability. Policy support was making everyone a little bit sad. Um, and public, they were just really confused about what we were all doing. So in 2024, have we made any progress? You can see a little bit of a snapshot here of some of the things we've been working on, that um, landfill site there is the site in New Zealand. So I thought what I would do is a very, very unscientific uh, little experiment where I went out to the local community and just had a chat with them about what they think about biogas and biomethane, whether they actually know what it is um, and how they're feeling about it. So I asked them a couple of questions and these are the responses that I got. So talking to the youth, Sounds like some sort of dinosaur name. Is it the thing that scientists make in the gas from the environment? I thought these answers were actually pretty good and pretty spot on for, for some kids. <clears throat> I went into uh, the general public. So people that don't work in the industry, you're going to get different answers from people that work within this industry. Um, so obviously people who um, you know, are looking at it possibly as a technology, they want to know if the numbers stack up. Um, if you are talking to just, you know, general uh, person in the community thinking about what it might contribute to our decarbonisation, our net zero target, um, they're a bit confused how it's different from natural gas. So we talk about renewable gas and natural gas and people are still a little bit confused what the difference is. So uh, there's a challenge there from a perception perspective. Um, and then you've got, you know, your general people in the community who love using gas and don't want it to go anywhere. Um, but again, the same questions come up, is it safe? And when you say biogas, people ask if it smells. Biogas smells, but biomethane smells like gas, which is the answer. Um, we also talked to the industry, so I went and hung out with my friends in the gas industry 
um, about a month ago. And these are just some of the comments that came out of uh, that conference, um, that people are really interested in uh, biomethane, um, but there's concerns around feedstock um, and whether or not we have enough feedstock in Australia to meet demand, which um, we absolutely do. And that there'll be issues in terms of location to available feedstock, so just how we're going to make this whole thing work, essentially. Um, there was also a lot of confusion around um, how renewable gas is renewable when we're still emitting CO2. Um, and that the sentiment is that it's an essential part of the energy mix, it's not the silver bullet uh, that will solve everyone's problems. So where we are now, technology has only gotten better. Um, you know, we've got the technology, the technology is mature, capability is still high kicking through that there. Everyone can, can prove that we can, we can build these, we can make these work um, and that they're viable. There's lots of companies in this room that are, are capable of um, you know, building this technology and delivering this technology in Australia. Policy support still meh. Um, and in terms of public perception, it's kind of moved, I guess, to a bit of a curiosity. Um, so I think that that's an improvement. It's not the same as last year. And um, I think it's an exciting opportunity to see where we're going. We've got some practical things that have changed since last year and we've got some, some runs on the board, um, which the gentleman will speak about. So this is just also just to finish on uh, some imagery of a couple of the um, upgrading plants that are in the Asia Pacific region. We can actually say now that there's real physical plants that are demonstrating, you know, and like I said, Brent will talk about Gemina, but um, it's a, you know, we've got actually got runs on the board now, so it's an exciting opportunity. But I will hand over to Matt from Blue Scope. Good. Thanks, everyone. the clicker. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for hanging in. There's a few more empty seats, but uh, it's okay. It makes it easier for us up here, I think. And uh, Shahana and, and the rest of the team, thank you, and um, congrats for putting on a couple of uh, big days. So um, I'm the manager of energy and carbon at Bluescope, which is the way of sort of saying that I look after our Australian energy portfolio. So I look after electricity, gas, uh, industrial gas and our water portfolio as well. And I suppose I get the question a bit, I've had it actually the last two days, what's Blue Scope doing here? Why is it interested in talking about biomethane? And I think at its highest, we are a, a pretty good latent source of demand. Um, these industries need end users. Uh, I have noticed that the program was pretty well stacked with developers and everybody other than the person who's paying for it. And so, it might be useful, I think, as these programs continue in the years to come, that more of us turn up and we give you some perspectives on why your industry may or may not be proceeding at the pace that you'd like it to. But first, I wanted to um, do a quick acknowledgement of country, uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet, and I'll pay my respects to past uh, leaders, past, present, and emerging. So, who is Blue Scope? Um, We've been around for quite some time, previously BHP Steel, but now of course Blue Scope and has been since 2001. We're actually a global business. Um, I actually work out of the Port Kembla Steelworks, um, but we do have a, a quite a big global footprint, about 17,000 employees across 17 countries. Uh, we have a rather large presence now, a quite a big emerging presence in the US. Uh, more, more than half of our profit is actually driven out of the US now and we participate in a number of different markets across that business uh, and in Australia as you can see we run a steel making business so we are the largest steel maker in the country but the only flat products producer so flat products are think of plate products which are used in the defence and renewable energy uh, industries uh, we also produce uh, we have metal coating and paint lines and we produce products that are branded such as Calibon Steel and True Course. If you ever drive past a steel frame with a blue, a blue frame, um, that's ours. Um, and there are some other products that are done in other places across the country and uh, world and of course in the ASEAN region as well we have a joint venture with Nippon Steel. 
So before I start talking about biomethane, I wanted to talk about why we think gas is critical for us and just to give you a bit of a sense of how we use gas. Um, we use four petajoules of natural gas each year across our sites in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. Queensland, the asterisk, I've probably got it in the wrong spot. It looks like we use 28 petajoules of gas in Queensland. We don't. Um, it's the asterisk across the four PJs. But um, let me explain why. Um, so in New South Wales, the Port Kembla Steelworks and the Spring Hill Works um, uses about two petajoules per annum. And the other two petajoules is used in Victoria and our Western Port Works. And we use it for a range of a range of reasons. Um, high heat, of course, we use natural gas intermittently for internal generation. Um, we also use it, though importantly, for heating in the furnace and providing other supplementary heat for our indigenous gases. So indigenous gases need the right ignition point. Um, that pedigule effectively for iron making is to support temperature control and to really get that heat up so that we can continue to use 28 petajoules of blast furnace and coke ovens gas, which is quite significant, captured as a byproduct of the iron making process. But importantly, it's also used in our metal coating lines and our paint lines, and it provides some preheating of our strip. It provides some solvent evaporation, so we use solvent-based paints in the Australian market. Uh, it cures the paint, and then it provides that atmospheric control. So it's not just about heat. Gas provides that absolute importance around process safety. Uh, we need to make sure that that solvent evaporates. We don't want to be putting people at harm's, in harm's way. We also need to make sure that the line is protected and there's a lot of chemistry and there's a lot of IP that goes into making a tier one prime product that Color Bond is. The Australian market is a harsh market in terms of its environmental conditions and so it requires quite stringent products. And we've been using natural gas like this um, developing this and evolving our supply chain for 96 years. So we're coming towards our centenary in Port Kembla, um, over 50 years in our Western Port business. And the processes that are underpinned by natural gas are highly evolved, highly mature and efficient processes. Once a blast furnace starts running, it never stops running. Um, the only time it stops running is when you're going to bank it. Um, and banking is not a, a value term. It's uh, that's value destruction, so we make sure that we keep our processes running. Now, some big numbers on this slide, and I wanted to walk through these quickly just to under so that we can understand the importance of gas within our business. For us, gas is actually a key feature of transitioning to lower carbon steel making. We're going to need a lot more gas, and I'm imagining if you've stared for about five seconds, you've found the number that says between 30 and 40 petajoules per annum of natural gas. That is a huge volume. If, if you're looking at the GSU, the New South Wales volume is about 130 petajoules. By the time we get to that, you add that on, we're almost a quarter of the market. And if you assume that there is demand destruction in the residential sector, we'll be more than a quarter of the total New South Wales market. So it's a material volume. We become one of the largest players in the country. At the moment, we use a blast furnace. A blast furnace will not get us to our net zero goal. We have a net zero goal, uh, net zero by 2050 goal. A blast furnace just cannot get there. There are improvements, absolutely, and we are working on our interim target. So we have a 1% year on year target for our front end process, so iron making by 2030, and a 30% emissions reduction target by 2030 for our midstream assets, which is our coated and painted lines. We've been working on a low carbon option study for the last six plus months, looking at how we move and evolve from a blast furnace. And we think that direct reduced iron, uh, which is a, uh, a, a proven, commercially proven technology, represents the most pres prospective technology for us to decarbonise. Um, we think the earliest will probably be around 2032. Um, it's somewhere in the 2030s. That's more of a, an early bookend. It probably won't be any earlier than that um, because this would require us to completely redo our entire supply chain. And we've, as I said, we've been working on our supply chain for a century. It takes a lot of movement to work through it. So we're looking at how do we change out of coal? And we think the coal to gas switch is the first step because green hydrogen, for those who have been playing in it, it is a long way away. It's a long way away. We'll need around one and a half gig 
gigawatts of firm green hydrogen. We'll need generation to support that. There is not enough transmission capacity to support that. And those things will take time to develop. In order for those, in order for us to move without waiting until green hydrogen is in place, we think that the best step is using gas as our bridge, allowing us to take more immediate action to decarbonise than waiting for another decade and decade and a half. And the emissions reduction potential is significant. So if we look at the comparison of emissions reduction compared to a blast furnace, we can reduce our emissions using natural gas by about 60%. That's around 3.6 million tonnes per annum for a single site. It's a, it's a material reduction. It becomes more material. We can take a further reduction if we move to green hydrogen. And the technology that we would in, roll out under a DOI process is actually a dual field, so it will allow us to make the transition from gas to hydrogen without having to do material upgrades into the future. But as you can see, it only gets us 85% of the way. There's still 15% that's left hanging. And that's where an opportunity does lie for biomethane. There are really two good enduring opportunities there. We've got six to eight petajoules that will be left. You need about 20% of your gas volume in the hydrogen world by, by volume in order for carbon to, be, to play its role in the steelmaking process. So carbon will still be required under a green hydrogen uh, DRI process. So why do we like biomethane? I'm going to go real quick because everybody sort of hit this. It's, it, it, is, it is methane, so it allows us to use our existing infrastructure, reduces our operational risk. We can't just electrify everything, as I've said. Our metal coating lines and our paint lines, there are technologies emerging for electrification, but there are actual physical constraint issues. We've developed our site over 100 years and things fit, whoop, things fit nicely. If you start disrupting that, it becomes very difficult. There are practical issues about how you can fit electrification in. Not to mention capital intensity. Moving to a DRI process is going to require billions in supply chain development and putting money towards electrification when alternatives might exist around biomethane is probably not the most efficient use of capital. But as I said, green steel needs carbon. We need carbon. The carburisation process improves steel quality and it means that our specifications stay. And it's important for us that we continue to service our market with colour bond, which is high quality. So I think everybody's spoken about this the last two days, but perhaps we'll just go stacks on the mill from an end user perspective need to be commercially competitive. If I can't get the price down, I can't sign up, right? It's me cutting the check, and it's important that I get that price as low as I humanly can. That requires foundational offtake, but it also requires, I think, and to the kind of point in the bottom there, it requires collaboration, right? We can't do it all our own. We're all going to have to come together. And I can see that there is a price differential between methane, and I think, Jared, you might have put up the media release from Orica. No one wants to pay a green premium. Certainly no one wants to pay more for a colour bond shed. So we need to work out how we can all do our bit to start shrinking the size of the, size of the price. And I won't talk about government support. I think we've laboured the point on that for the last two days, and I know there's a few government people, Eric, I can see in the back. So no doubt he's listening, taking the notes, and he's got it ready to go. And importantly, supply chain for us. We need feedstock security. I have a secure supply chain right now for gas. I don't want to disrupt that. Our operations are 24-7. It's just important that that keeps coming through. And the value of the certification scheme as it starts to develop needs to be constant. So with that, I'm, I'm done. I think I was about to get a second bell. So thank you very much for your attention. Hi everyone, my name is Sina Kevani and I work uh, at APA, leading research and new ventures in the Future Energy team. I'll start off with uh, an overview of our assets uh, across the country. So we own and are operated a $27 billion portfolio of energy infrastructure assets across the country. Um, that includes about 15,000 kilometers of high pressure gas transmission, it includes gas storage, distribution. Um, on the electricity infrastructure side, we have a growing portfolio of renewable electricity generation plus gas firming to firm the supply for our customers. Um, and we also have a growing portfolio of 
um, electricity transmission across the country. At APA, our strategy is to be the partner of choice in delivering energy infrastructure for the energy transition. And our focus is based on uh, four pillars, um, contract of renewables plus firming, electricity transmission, gas transportation, and future energy. At, at APA, we also have a pretty ambitious climate transition plan, um, where our goal is to reach net zero in the gas infrastructure business by 2050, um, and net zero in the power electricity business by 2040. Uh, we also have interim goals um, that in the gas side, it's 30% emission reductions uh, by 2030. On the electricity side, 35% reduction in emission intensity uh, for power generation by 2030. What we're doing is uh, investing to achieve those goals and our emission reduction investments are evaluated based on an internal carbon price which we set at a premium to offsets to ensure that we're favoring actual reductions over offset credits. Um, on this slide, I wanted to share uh, three key messages uh, on biomethane from our perspective. To start off, we think biomethane is a valuable decarbonization tool in the transition to a net zero world. Um, it's largely fungible with the existing natural gas infrastructure. So there's no such thing as a blend ball, theoretically, for it to be introduced into the system. We also think there's a prospects for it to play an important role in firming variable renewable electricity, um, where it sort of acts like a long duration energy storage, if you will, in the existing gas system that's already established across the country. Secondly, we think Australia has ample potential for producing biomethane. Um, the supply and demand outlook is largely driven by policy and regulations, and folks have already touched upon that. And the last point we wanted to make is we think carbon intensity and pricing are both equally important when it comes to biomethane. Um, and how we look at that is carbon abatement versus an alternative is key when procuring biomethane. And I have an example on the bottom right hand side of the slide um, where we really want to highlight um, the carbon intensity of 150 biomethane products in the California LCFS market and show how they compared to a reference line in, um, in black, which is showcasing natural gas. And as you can see, there's a huge disparity or a huge range in terms of the differences between different biomethane products in that market. And that's where carbon intensity becomes important. So with that background, um, I wanted to talk about the announcement that APA made today where we are going out to the market and seeking expressions of interest for, from biomethane suppliers across Australia to supply us with biomethane. This non-binding EOI will help us assess the viability of biomethane as a decarbonization solution for our assets across Australia. Um, biomethane can be used directly in our gas-fired assets or indirectly when accounted for through an um, accounting mechanism such as book and claim. Um, we prefer the supply to be integrated into our system of pipelines, but uh, we're open to other people's pipelines. Um, or considering uh, direct use of biogas or biomethane in our gas-fired assets across the country. Uh, what we aim to do is shortlist a set of suppliers after this process into, uh, for the RFB phase, subject to an ad internal advancement decision. Um, some of the things that we're going to be looking for in this EOI are you know, an indicative pricing range, uh, emission abatement potential, uh, and also uh, social procurement considerations such as First Nations ownership and partnership. And that's per our uh, reconciliation action plan that you can find on our website. Uh, interested parties are uh, invited to register their interest on our website. Um, and I'll show you a link after this slide. Um, and the, the EOI process will start as of today with the registration of interest and it'll go until the 30th of April um, for folks hoping to participate. Uh, this slide just covers um, or highlights our gas-fired assets across the country for that direct use case if we choose to go that route. Um, our gas-fired generation plants are across the country, but we have major hubs in the Mount Isa region and the uh, Pilbara region uh, for, for renewables plus firming. 
On the compression side for the gas infrastructure, um, we have compressors along our pipelines. Um, so those uh, red bubbles that you see on the map are generally where our compressors are um, across the country. And so there is a lot of opportunity to use biomethane or biogas directly if that opportunity arises. And with that, um, I have a link here. So if you want to get more information or register for the EOI, you can go to apa.com.au slash biomethane EOI, um, or you can use the QR code there. Um, and that's it. If you have any questions in general, um, please feel free to email us at pathfinder at apa.com.au. Afternoon. It's good to see there's still a few faces left in the audience. Um, it's been a, a great event. I want to thank uh, Bioenergy Australia for putting on such a great event the last couple of days. Um, it's been really good to see how these events have uh, grown and become bigger and better um, over the years. Uh, so thank you, Bioenergy Australia. Um, my name is Brent Davis. I'm a commercial manager of gas processing at Gemini and today I just want to take the opportunity to talk about some of the learnings and insights that we've had uh, in delivering our um, Malabar project and uh, really I was going to focus today on uh, some of the opportunities that we, we've seen as we're developing the project. Uh, for those of you who don't know Gemini, we are an energy infrastructure company. We own uh, and operate electricity, or both electricity and gas assets uh, across Australia. We have one of the um, gas, uh, one of the electricity distribution networks down in Victoria. We have uh, the gas distribution network in New South Wales, and we've got gas transmission pipelines along the east coast and the Northern Territory. Uh, having both electricity and gas assets does put us in a bit of a unique position to talk about the important role that gas can play in uh, Australia's uh, energy future. Um, and we are quite proud um, to have developed Australia's first um, biomethane injection facility. Uh, the facility is located at uh, Sydney's wastewater treatment facility at Malabar. Um, I think you've seen a lot of photos of the location already today, which is uh, quite pleasing uh, that everyone wants to talk about the, the project. That's really why we did it. Um, we, we partnered with Sydney Water at their um, wastewater treatment facility there. They were already um, generating biogas from the wastewater sludge that they're uh, capturing there. And they were using uh, that gas to generate uh, on-site electricity um, uh, or generate electricity for on-site power. Uh, there was, however, excess gas that they were then um, just sending to flare uh, and burning off. Uh, we partnered with uh, Arena and Sydney Water to capture that excess gas, to process it and clean it up uh, so it could be injected into the, the gas distribution network in Sydney. Uh, we are aiming to produce roughly 900, uh, 95, 900 would be great, um, 95 uh, terajoules uh, per atom um, from that facility and to put that into perspective uh, in uh, that's about the average annual consumption of 6,300 uh, homes in New South Wales. Um, uh, so from uh, as we worked through this um, this project uh, there were a few uh, learnings and a few opportunities that we've seen along the way. Um, one of those opportunities, uh, which I'll touch on a few and uh, a few times today, was the opportunity to partner with uh, players that are outside of the traditional gas um, industry, if you like. So, uh, players such as Sydney Water um, coming in to potentially generate um, energy in our system. Uh, further to that opportunity, we've seen the opportunity in a world where you have a number of facilities like our Malabar site. Uh, where you can generate uh, or where we can contribute to the Australian economy by uh, creating thousands of jobs, both direct and indirect, through the establishment of the biomethane um, industry. And a lot of those jobs would be in regional areas and support uh, local economies. And then further to that, um, the opportunity for biomethane to support uh, important sectors of the Australian economy. Uh, if you um, 
uh, through through the uh, injection of the gas, uh, the biomethane that we've uh, uh, captured at Sydney Water and injected into our network, we've demonstrated the uh, compatibility of biomethane with infrastructure and the existing uh, gas appliances and the ability for it to support important sectors like the manufacturing sector, um, which contributes around $120 billion uh, a year to the Australian economy. So uh, a lot of potential. But to recognise this potential, we need to develop the bio in um, biomethane industry. Um, and if I stood here uh, this time last year, I probably would have said that I think the biomethane industry in Australia is in its infancy. Uh, I think I stand here today and, and I think we've, uh, we've seen and, and heard a lot of presentations over the last couple of days that back this up. I think we could say that the bioenergy industry in Australia has grown up a little bit um, and perhaps it's ready to be sent off to school. I think you could say it's, it's got some good foundations and it's ready to grow and develop. Um, but just like when we, we send our kids off to school, it, uh, we ensure that they've got an environment to develop in and there's a few key things we need to ensure so that our industry's got the uh, environment to develop. First of that is we need a clear policy um, setting. We, we need clear policies so that we can attract the investment that's needed to develop the industry and to give consumers the confidence that they're getting a green product. Um, again, I, I was going to say I was going to touch on partnerships a bit. I think we need to take a serious look about how we, um, we partner in this industry and the opportunity um, to change the way we've traditionally done business in this, this industry. Uh, and then the third one being uh, the importance of having a skilled uh, labour force to develop and deliver these type of projects. Um, one of the key learnings we had at developing the Mal Malabar project was just how important it is to have local skill and knowledge to be able to deliver these projects. So touching on that first point and in policy and certification, um, I'm really pleased today to be able to announce that uh, Malabar has achieved another Australian first. Um, it has become the first biomethane facility in Australia to uh, have green power accreditation. And we've also produced the first uh, renewable gas certificates in Australia. And this, I think, is a really significant um, step forward for our industry. Um, it's important to have this recognition. <laughs> So I think it's a, it's a really important step, um, a little bit like uh, I had a discussion uh, earlier, it's a little bit like that uh, green and gold kangaroo, uh, little uh, triangle emblem you get to, sort of to, to tell consumers that uh, it's an Australian made and owned product. Having that green power um, certification uh, gives consumers the confidence that the, that the gas they're using is a low emission fuel um, and I think that's really important for our industry. Uh, what I would ask though um, from this point, and I, I'd like to thank the Green Power guys firstly for all the work that they've done um, to create this scheme, uh, but from here what I'd really like to see is us to be able to set up a framework that would create uh, the ability for those Green Power certificates to be recognised as widely as possible. Um, and in particular, I'm not going to be the first uh, and potentially not the last to ask for this, um, but we really need to see that recognised under Engers uh, so that that renewable gas, that, like, just like we produce at Malabar, can be used to help safeguard em entities lower their emissions through their energy use. On the partnerships, the second uh, pillar I had there, um, what I'd really like to see is if there's an opportunity um, for uh, the traditional businesses and established businesses in the gas sector, like Gemina, uh, to step in and look at how we can create mutually beneficial partnerships with, um, with new players in the industry. Um, there's, I think, a lot of opportunity here for us to look at how we can have um, work, working partnerships uh, to all achieve a common goal of trying to decarbonise Australia's energy future. Uh, you, uh, Gemina has been working um, and continues to work with a number of uh, renewable gas um, producers uh, to try and bring renewable gas to the market. Uh, you may have seen at the end of last year we announced our MOU with um, Optimal Renewable Gas um, to uh, look to develop a number of sites in New South Wales to bring um, biomethane to the market. 
Um, we continue to work with um, other renewable gas producers um, to try and bring biomethane uh, to the East Coast market as well. Uh, we partnered with Sydney Water uh, on our Malabar projects. We also partnered with uh, Origin Energy at Malabar to bring uh, firstly the gas and, and now hopefully the certificates um, to the market as well. And we see a lot of potential uh, for these partnerships uh, to help accelerate our industry. And lastly, the final uh, point I wanted to make was just the importance of uh, ensuring that we continue to develop uh, a workforce that can support uh, these projects um, being delivered. If you think about um, that a lot of the uh, a lot of positions that need to be filled to help deliver these these projects are going to require a three or four year degree. Add to that, um, you know, a few years of uh, on the work on the job experience, and you're looking at nearly a decade before you've got the new workforce coming through. Um, so it's something that uh, I'm not standing here today to say that we've got the answers to, but something that we think is in, important. We, we've seen that with um, trying to deliver our Malabar project, and uh, something as an industry we need to um, keep our eye on. Um, I'll leave it there for today. I've hit, I think I've almost hit the time. Uh, thanks very much for your time, and um, happy to talk to you afterwards. Ooh. Okay, missed the first slide. Um, look, for those that don't know me, my name is Mike Davis. I'm the Managing Director of Optimal Renewable Gas. Uh, and today I was going to talk um, a little bit more specifically about uh, regional opportunities uh, in New South Wales. So I'm specifically going to look at the biomethane injection opportunities of regional New South Wales. And in doing that, I was going to focus across the supply chain. So look at feedstock, technology, infrastructure and market. Um, but before I get started, just a quick little background uh, about Optimal Renewable Gas. We're a developer. Uh, we're a developer of large scale anaerobic digestion facilities. Principally, we focus on agricultural waste and residues, um, which I'll get to as, to as to why we target those feedstocks. Um, and we focus on biomethane production, again, focusing on uh, grid injection where we can, provide de to, to provide decarbonisation pathways uh, for industrial users and other users of gas that uh, don't have um, other available electrification options or, or easier, easy decarbonisation options. Um, we're proposing to develop 10 projects across Australia by 2030, uh, and that includes four regional bio hubs in New South Wales. Um, I'll just move on. Um, so across those four regional bio hubs, three are covered under a MOU which, uh, we, uh, that uh, Brent discussed uh, with, with Gemina. Um, and our fourth is in another regional area, which I'll, I'll get into. But all in all, we're focusing on processing around 800,000 tonnes of organic waste and residues from those regional areas. Uh, and that will see us produce around about five petajoules of biomethane into existing gas infrastructure. Not only do we target the reduction of emissions for um, those industrial businesses that, uh, that we're targeting to work with, uh, we we'll also look to improve the management of uh, regional organic waste. So by that I mean we build out circular economies. A lot of this organic waste is sitting idle. Um, it's, uh, it's burnt, as, as Scott would have uh, mentioned. Um, either way, it's just not well utilised. So by building biohubs, what we can do is not just get the energy, but get the, the nutrients, the digestate, back into a, a, a better and more usable form for agriculture and also build out markets for biogenic CO2. Um, to talk about the market, and I won't go too much here other than to say, let's have a look at the biomethane supply chain, which we can actually say that we've got now, thanks to Gemini. So this is New South Wales biomethane supply chain. Um, a big supply chain, because the feedstocks are there, the gas infrastructure there, and the gas market's there. And so whilst we are in the infancy of the biomethane market with one facility operating, the only missing piece for that whole market to turn a large amount of organic waste and residues to reliable renewable energy is investment in large scale anaerobic digestion and gas upgrading. And that's where, to me, in terms of New South Wales, there's a really strong opportunity. 
Um, as I said before, that feedstock is often not utilised, and I'll get to some details around that feedstock. Um, but if we talk about the technology, and Scott touched upon it, hundreds of thousands of operating anaerobic digestion facilities around the world, 100,000 in, in China alone. So a proven technology. So you know, we can apply a proven technology to utilise these waste streams to provide a reliable and renewable energy through existing gas infrastructure to these end customers. So to talk uh, feedstock, um, I think initially everyone asked me, where is the feedstock? Is there enough of it? Um, the short answer is yes, there's a lot of feedstock. There's a lot of residual waste and residues uh, right across uh, Australia. I'm specifically talking about New South Wales, so I'll focus on, on New South Wales. Um, a lot of people's minds just go straight to municipal waste and wastewater because of our, our, our dense population. But by far the large proportion of, of um, feedstock, waste and residue, is in, is in agricultural areas. And if we look at New South Wales, it's the reason for that. There's a lot of uh, cropping. There's a lot of aggregation of poultry, piggeries. We're a large in, in, you know, uh, agricultural um, uh, area. So, so we have a lot of residual biomass that we can actually utilise, and we can utilise in the form of biomethane. Um, so when we, you know, this is um, some New South Wales uh, ABBA, I love that, um, uh, data, but, but basically shows there's about 22 and a half million dry tonnes of organic waste um, around New South Wales. And you can see in that graph, the lion's share is in agricultural areas. We estimate from that there's around 200 petajoules of available biomethane. And then looking at the coincidence of that feedstock, what could be commercially aggregated and what's in and around gas infrastructure, we think there's around about 50 to 100 petajoules um, of gas that can be produced. Next is technology. I'm not going to spend pretty much any time here other than to say it's a proven technology. It biologic, it's an existing biological process, microbial uh, breakdown of organic material in the absence of oxygen. Um, we can harness it, we can utilise it. Um, fair to say, that there is great low-hanging fruit from our existing biogas facilities that are currently flaring or producing an unresponsive electron. We have a really good opportunity if they are near existing infrastructure to upgrade that gas, get that gas in the form of a molecule, which then can be used on demand and support some optionality for decarbonisation. But again, the lion's share from our perspective is in these agricultural areas. So bringing proven tech about large-scale anaerobic digestion in regional areas, which is, again, a trend that we've seen in, in many of the countries that have uh, biomethane policies. And whilst it is a mature tech, always port, uh, point to the great work that uh, our tertiary sector could, could do in terms of further enhancing the biomethane production. In terms of our feedstock, so really understanding what we could do to uh, pre-treat, uh, co-digest additives to increase biomethane production. The next is the age-old question, you know, where, where you've got renewable energy, where do you get it to where and when it's needed? Um, obviously a challenge that happens in uh, renewable electricity. And I think this is where biomethane um, has a very strong synergy with existing gas infrastructure. Because not only does the gas infrastructure enable, enable you to plug into existing infrastructure, you know, you're a drop-in fuel, um, so you've got a transport and a distribution pathway, but you've got, a, you've got an inherent storage. Um, so a, a, lot, a, a huge underplay of, the, of, of gas in the transitioning energy system is the inherent storage that is in that gas infrastructure, including gas storage facilities that, that are tied into that. So uh, whilst we look in New South Wales and tying into you know, the, the potential 30,000 kilometres uh, of existing transmission and distribution infrastructure, the East Coast market is integrated, um, meaning that you can actually tie in to a collective storage capacity of about, 100 and, about 160 uh, petajoules uh, of storage. Now, what that means for industrial businesses is that the energy that they can get supplied can be firmed and reliable. Um, most businesses want to do the right thing, but at the end of the, end of the day, they want to run 24-7. They need firm, reliable power. And that's where biomethane, coupled with gas infrastructure, not only provides a benefit for those industrial users, but it provides a lot of energy system benefits. So it provides energy, energy system flexibility. Uh, you know, we heard from APA, they've, you know, they've also um, got um, 
some, some um, uh, gas uh, fired uh, assets. Having a renewable gas that you can actually provide responsive renewable energy um, and leverage that storage capacity brings enormous energy system strength, which is what you're going to need in a transitioning energy system. So I just want to make that point, biomethane is just not an end user play. It's actually, I like to think of it as a bio battery. It's an energy system benefit. And that's when I look at stacking the benefits, it's not just the end user. And when I look at if there's any kind of scheme or incentive that can come into this market, it should be recognising that system strength and flexibility that biomethane and gas infrastructure can deliver. And finally, everyone's touched upon this point. Um, you know, it's one thing to have a physical connection. Um, we must have a market connection. Um, so voluntary demand can be brought to the market. I'll speak specifically from a developer. We need that demand so we can underwrite the much needed investment um, across the supply chain. Um, and they need the recognition um, so they can reduce their scope one emission. So, Great work, uh, Gemma and Green Power, and um, amazing to see that we can actually talk about certification. We can show that it's done, um, but obviously calling out the need for uh, uh, a guarantee of origin or federal recognition of that scheme to give the confidence of scope one emission reductions. Yeah, so just, uh, so just wrapping up, I mean, I, I just want to summate by just touching those high points again for biomethane opportunities in New South Wales. The feedstocks are there and underutilised. We have an opportunity to pro provide proven technology, use existing infrastructure and supply businesses that don't need to change the infrastructure behind the metre. That brings a decarbonisation optionality to them, system benefits. It also provides regional energy security. A lot of these projects are supplied in regional areas bring the form of production into those, those areas. It also provides regional investment um, and, and regional jobs. So I'll finish now, but I just wanted to talk about the, the overall uh, opportunities across the supply chain for biomethane. So thank you. Hello everyone. Um, thank you Shahana of Bioenergy Australia for all the work you've done to get us to this point. <coughs> Thanks for everyone who's still managed to stay here. Um, I guess I'm a little bit out on my own here. Um, what is a farming company doing here? Um, <coughs> Calfresh, we're a vertically integrated vegetable grower. Um, we're here to talk about how agriculture and agricultural waste can deliver Australia's carbon neutral future food. Uh, fuel. <coughs> um, and I'm probably going to come at it from a little bit of a different perspective. So who is Calfresh? We are a farming company. Um, on any given day, we deliver renewable energy in the form of vegetables so people can eat <coughs> and power yourself through the day. Um, there's a, a little bit of information about us, um, but primarily we already have a food production system that can be a feed produ uh, feedstock production system. Um, growing energy crops fits our mandate. <coughs> Calfresh as a company, we're here to create a better farming future for our community, consumers and the environment. Um, renewable energy, we believe it will play a small but growing part of that business today and it'll be something that we think is quite important for the future. <coughs> Why did we get into it? Um, as part of a food business, what we, ne uh, what we need to do is we need to produce more convenient food products. What more convenient food products means is we need to process them more. So to do that, that requires large-scale investment in our packing and automated processing facilities in regional areas. So what we did was we, um, we got in touch with the Queensland Government in 2018, about November, and we said, look, we want to build an industrial precinct so we can, when we spend $40 million on a processing facility, we don't want it to become a large isolated asset in the middle of, on the side of the highway in a farming area. 
<coughs> we want it to have industrial zoning. Now, as part of that, um, because we'd seen it overseas, we drew a little 500 kilowatt um, biogas digester because we'd seen some farming friends in the UK build one. We thought that'd be a good idea. <coughs> Three months later, they came back to us and they said, we'll declare your project a coordinated project of um, state significance and we'll help you get th through all your approvals, but you've got to build that bioenergy thing. We said, right, okay, we'll do that. <coughs> and away we went. And then, by the way, we asked for 40 hectares thinking they'll give us four, but they ended up giving us 39.2. So we had a bigger job to do than we thought. Um, we did genuinely want to power our precinct with bioenergy. Um, we do currently have 30% of our current processing crop ends up as a stock feed or, you know, what people term as a waste. We don't actually call it a waste. Just so you know, as we move into processed foods more, that gets up to 60 to 70%. So of the 50,000 tonnes per annum that we'll process, <clears throat> up to 60% of that will end up as a feedstock. So we're not alone in that space. Hence the reason we put it into the precinct. Um, just so you know, that is a really long and arduous task. So it's taken us five years, and um, I think people were talking about digestate and end our waste code. So it, we, we wrote our own end of waste code um, just so we can use it as our own fertiliser. But that is, a, that is a long, hard and expensive journey. <clears throat> so when, when it came to bioenergy, you can see that we've got quite a large plant drawn in the corner now. That started as like one or two fermenters and quite a small project. We got about three years in and um, what we realised was some of the business modelling we were doing on it, we could see the future. So we went back to the state government and said, what if we wanted to build a 10 megawatt facility or something that can do a lot of gas? And they said, well, we'll have to stop, go back and you might add a year to your journey. So make the call now. So we decided to stop, go back and decide to redesign it because we could see the future and we saw what was happening in Europe. And we developed a closed, move, closed loop energy model <coughs> and you know we focused on these offtakes. Now one of them there is renewable natural gas um, and green CO2. Now we knew about the fertiliser, we knew about the power. We'd also found some intellectual property around adding certain um, probiotics to the fertiliser, also lifting the nitrogen content and what that actually allowed us to do was we could put this into our farming system which meant we were stopping our traffic from driving in the farm, we were getting six months worth of nutrition into the ground at the same time. It, it, it stopped us having to um, do other activities so it saved us money on our crop gross margins. So we actually started bringing in Biodunder um, from the Serena ethanol plant and for the last six years we've been integrating that into our farming system. Now it works, so we grow most of our vegetables with Biodunder now and we have vastly reduced chemical fertilisers. So um, just if anyone's worrying about can we grow the feedstock and is it going to replace food supply, no that is not a problem. Uh, our history tells us it makes our food production land better it helps us uh, put carbon back into the soil in the way of increased organic matter from the energy crop. And we grow more food today per hectare in this system than we did without it. So there's a little bit of a fallacy there about worrying about our food supply. That's not true. <coughs> um, uh, we have gone down a track of RNG. Um, so a 10 megawatt energy system, <coughs> it can produce quite a lot of biogas. So that's enough RNG to run 234 trucks travelling a thousand kilometres a year. So it is a direct replacement for diesel, but it means you have to partner. So the engines that can use it, uh, you got to go to Cummins. Cummins builds a very good engine. The VECO have a very good engine. But this technology is there. It's what you can bolt into the trucks we drive today. You can order a new truck with it. You just can't do that in Australia yet. Um, and while there are a lot of other avenues for biomethane, some which I've learned in the last 20 minutes, 
the one we do, we have a trucking bill. So on any given month, we spend about a million dollars on trucking fuel. So <clears throat> we were just looking at, right, let's use our fertiliser bill and let's use our trucking bill. And let's go to the people that truck our produce and also truck other people's produce and truck other people's things. And it's just like, what have we got in our own um, P&L sheet that we can help fund this? Because, you know, as Mr Bluescope said, the people who pay the bills are the ones that make it work. <laughs> Um, the other thing is RNG vehicles can reduce carbon six times faster than wind or solar powered battery vehicles. Like that's just the truth. So if you go to Europe or you travel around, like I've been seven trips around the world looking at this stuff and you walk up to the, <coughs> the clean energy fuel station or the bus station in Denmark and you go what actually works and what pays the bills, that's what's working. So that bottom photo there, that's actually from uh, Bus Depot in Silkberg in uh, Denmark. That business of uh, Nature Energy was started by an organic chicken farmer. Just, I think Shell just paid 2.9 billion Australian dollars for it. <coughs> so if you're worried about whether this thing's got a future, he did pretty well. Um, so Europe now has 132, uh, 1,322 biomethane producing facilities. So there's lots of um, biogas facilities, but that's what they've got in the way of biomethane. So that, that number in the seven years I've been traveling, that's grown a lot. Um, there's lots of stats there, but basically the story is it's growing a lot. And then those buses, that's a picture I actually took. So that's not an image stock from Google or wherever you get them. <coughs> and the clean energy, I think they have about 700 of those stations now. So they work. So what we think Australia's opportunity is, look, after, our, after years of R&D, so we've spent, alongside the Queensland government, you know, we've spent about two and a half million dollars. They've spent about the same. Um, we have privately funded our project um, <coughs> because look, we just probably didn't have the time to do it any other way. Um, and we wanted to keep any intellectual property developed to ourselves. Um, so this is what we think. Um, there is a real solution here, hence the reason we're, we're going to invest in it. And, you know, Deloitte's have been good. They'll be doing our capital raising for um, this project in the near future. <coughs> There's, it is a carbon neutral uh, diesel replacement. Um, the engines work really well. Aveco's latest engine now only needs to be serviced every, uh, I think it's 90,000 kilometres. So that's real. Um, there is genuine cost savings. Um, greenhouse gas reductions are really impressive. <coughs> it provides green gas for households and reinduction into the grid. Look, there's a bit of work to be done around the distribution there. Um, we're, we're a farming company, I can't solve that for you. Um, <coughs> but it's a good product, right? The other thing I want to add is what convinced us to keep investing money in it and resetting and adding two years, it was nearly two years to our journey, was when we visited the regional areas overseas, um, they were empowered, like it's another crop. So every day we trade with Woolworths, Coles, Aldi, Costco. <coughs> and if you've heard bad things about them, they're all true. <laughs> They're tough customers to deal with, right? So, uh, you know, I'm over here at Parliament in about an hour's time, you know, there's a Senate inquiry into their behaviour, you know, they need one. So, <coughs> we're looking, the, the agricultural industry is looking for diversification, right? It's a good thing. Everything that's happening here, it's a good thing. Don't worry about the feedstock, we got you covered. It's a great thing for us to be part of. So, <clears throat> less synthetic fertiliser. Um, it's not just about a cost thing. It works better. Uh, live fertiliser, biological fertiliser, whatever you want to call it, you know, we've proven it. It's a better thing. You know, it leaches less. It, it can carry uh, the next generation of crop protection is all biological. It's not chemical. That's not the future. That's what's happening in Europe. So we're not going to get a choice to buy the old stuff anymore. <clears throat> so... Having biological fertiliser is really good. Look, we think RNG is the way to go. We're open to all the options, but there's a few numbers up there to tell our story. Um, 
I'm just thankful that you gave us the time and we're looking forward to um, building this project in the next couple of years. And I'd also like to say thanks to anyone who's from here from the Queensland Government who's still here. They've been fantastic partners. They've been really good. Oh, sorry, I forgot this slide. That's just a good bar graph. That's the carbon intensity. So it says RNG from manure. That's a clean energy slide. Um, but that's real. Like whether it's manure or energy crop or agricultural feedstock, there's a really good carbon intensity um, just by re replacing the fuel and sequestering the carbon in the farm, that's how you get there. And I guess we've done enough work to prove it, we believe it. And there's a list of all the other things you've all got to do for us. <laughs> By the way, that's another real image of our own corn paddock. <laughs> Thanks very much, Richard. That's fantastic. And I, I do have to apologise, being the last person here, I know everyone is very keen to, to leave and I'm sure they've got flights almost underway or getting ready. So um, I will add that was absolutely fantastic by Richard. I found one of the most uh, enjoyable parts of my experience within the biogas to biomethane industry has been the work working with the agricultural sector in particular i've found it very quite eye-opening how and again this is probably my own ignorance to the sector how smart they are with regards to managing their land and the ability to be able to grow the, the right crops and be smart around rotational cropping and the amount of projects that we're working on with partners now that are providing us with amazing solutions that we, we we didn't even think about and it's it's fantastic to see and yeah really credit to the work that your organization is doing Richard so I spoke before and I, I do apologize you have to hear from me again but on the barriers and I guess it'd be remiss of me not to talk about how do we actually how do we solve these or what are we actually doing so I did touch on them briefly but I'm going to go into a bit more detail around what us as a gas industry is doing uh, in particular, the work that Australian Gas Infrastructure has been doing over the past six months with regards to understanding our own infrastructure and the biomethane potential. So we tend to have a lot of these conversations about how big's the piece of the pie. It's not just how big's the pie, it's also how close is it, how commercial is it, how close is it to our networks to be commercial. So we really wanted to understand that. And then the collaboration piece. So we talk about this quite regularly. and we're going to talk about in a bit more detail with regards to how, how can we enable these projects. And that'll be a, a partnership that we'll be talking about, which will be really exciting. So hopefully you can stay. I'm not gonna to talk to this slide, it's been done. Everyone would know by now what we've been talking about. So that's really exciting. Biogas to biomethane as well. I'll fly through this. We know the process. So we take biogas from an anaerobic digestion process in general or from landfill. We upgrade it through a biogas upgrader. We, take, we remove the constituents like moisture, volatile organic compounds, hydrogen sulfide and other products. We can end up with biogenic CO2 and then we can put it into the gas network. Now, for us, we need to understand what the opportunity is. I apologize for people wanting a photo, but I'm trying to fly through to the fun bits. So I know everyone's very keen to go home. Um, what we did as a business, we, we looked across our assets and we, we kept getting the same question when we were talking about promoting biomethane. And it was, yes, we understand that it's there, it exists. How much can you get into your networks? And we didn't really know the answer to that question. So it was probably something that we really needed to investigate it. So we sat down with Blunamy and we went through some of the existing data that's available, as well as some of the information that we had as a business from industry. So that includes the potential identification that we did as a business and merge that with the data set that Blunamy had, as well as the publicly available information. Now we know there's challenges with those data sets. It's publicly known that there are challenges, but what we did is we took the theoretical potential biomethane potential within the, within the states that we're based. We then work through a recoverable potential. So what, under two different scenarios, business as usual or a policy enabled scenario, what do those recoverable potentials look like? 
Again, policy enabled scenario, you're talking about removal of straw burning. We've talked about some of those policy levels, organics from landfill, for instance. We then had a look at, well, how close are they to our infrastructure assets? So we did a 50 kilometres basis of aggregating that into our infrastructure assets. And what we identify is generally you're starting to hit the verge of commercial viability as you get longer than 50 kilometres as part of transportation. So we put our networks, we provided that to Bloonamy, and then we started mapping those opportunities. So you can see our network spread across South Australia, Queensland and Victoria. Now you can see the business as usual scenario, which provides how much volume we can potentially get within the vicinity of our networks. And then again, it, under a policy enabled scenario. So you see that acceleration in volume and you see the darker colors. Again, there's a lot of opportunity across Queensland, South Australia and Victoria. Again, there's a lot of information on New South Wales, um, but again, we haven't shown that on this image, but we are working on that in the background, which is there is a potential for cross-border opportunity. So yes, Victoria's network, uh, it, it's bounded by Victoria, the work that we've done so far, but we're extending that into what it looks like from a New South Wales perspective as well, being able to catch some of that across the border. So what did we identify? So as part of this work, we found a BAU recoverable uh, volume by, a, by state of around 40 petajoules within the vicinity of our networks. We found a policy enabled scenario, again, talking about those organics diversion from landfill, around 80 petajoules within 50 kilometers of our network. Now for us, it meant that when we looked at our South Australian network, as well as our Queensland network, it was complete decarbonisation of our distribution networks. It wasn't just complete decarbonisation, it was in excess. So for instance, Queensland was almost 300% above our usage in our distribution networks. Not only that, it's the direct job opportunities and it's the waste reduction as well as the digestate potential. Obviously there is a lot of complexities with managing that, but then there's the 4.1 million tonnes of carbon dioxide emission reductions from the displacement of fossil fuel quite significant within our networks. So from a practicality sense, this is giving us the ability to discuss those policy frameworks and say, well, this is the size of the pie. This is the size of the pie we can get into our networks. We believe that if the opportunity presents itself, we can decarbonise a large volume of our existing network and an existing supply. And we can increase jobs and create a circular economy while we're at it. But I guess a big question is how do we enable the opportunity? And we speak a lot about collaboration in this industry and I think there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes which probably doesn't come out in this setting. So we have a multitude of projects underway at the moment that with the majority we can't speak about working with project partners to try and deliver these projects. And I spend a lot of my time trying to work on these projects to get them to a point where we can make a financial investment decision. And being unable to share those projects is at times frustrating, but for us, it is exciting that we're working on an opportunity with LMS to deliver 1.8 petajoules into the Victorian gas network as part of two foundation projects. So we've, work, we've worked through the concept and the capability as part of those projects, being able to get them online. We've been working with LMS for quite some time. We're looking at we're working through the feasibility and going to take the project through front end engineering and design. We have an aggressive time frame to meet internally and externally to demonstrate that these projects can be done. Again, it's not going to be easy. We have revenue stacks to work with, but we have project partners that are on board that are partnering that understand the technology, the deliverability and the technical and economical uh, challenges that we may have. But these projects give us not only the ability to see what can we do, it also gives us something to turn around to policy makers and say, well, it's real, this is how real we can make it. And I think that's really, really important being able to show what we can do. So we're gonna progress these projects. So we have two of them, one up to one point, uh, up to one petajoule, and we have another up to 800 TJs. Again, as part of that techno-economic modeling and feasibility work, we're going to really try and understand well, what's the capability long term. Landfills aren't going to be filled 
long term. So you've got to gauge what the life of the landfill is, the capability long term. And these are all the assessments that are being undertaken. We're going to work hard to that FID. And for us as a business, it's critical to reach financial investment decision on, on, on projects like this, because what we're seeing from the hydrogen industry and, and development space is policy can be developed from these projects. You can take a risk early, understanding that policy frameworks can come and you can demonstrate. People want to see and feel these things. And with Gemini's projects, it's fantastic, but we want to be able to build this industry off multiple projects that demonstrate we can do it and we can do it now. It's been done internationally. And again, if this is successful, we'll roll out similar projects on some of the other facilities working alongside LMS. Again, a little bit more detail on some of the work that LMS have done in terms of the design with their delivery partners and a little bit more imagery. So this is all work that's been done in the background, working towards delivering projects and actual projects and Tiana is in the room from LMS, so appreciate the support that LMS has given us on these projects. Um, and again, this is about collaboration and partnership in this industry. So I guess from our perspective, that's really what we're doing to try and enable, and we're working hard towards it as a gas industry, but also really a, as a bioenergy industry. And we see ourselves playing a key role in that space moving forward. And thank you. Got about 15 minutes for questions. Is there anyone in the audience who's got a question for one of our panel members? Just raise your hand and we'll get a mic. Nothing? Okay. Um, hi, uh, Lisa Randana from Marina. I've got a question for uh, Matt. Scope. Um, so obviously you mentioned you're looking at replacing your natural gas with hydrogen in your DRI process in the long term. Um, just wondering whether uh, renewable methane uh, can play a role in, in the transition as a reductant or we're really talking about a too big scale that we wouldn't be able to um, have enough material for that process. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think you've probably hit the nail on the head, which is the size for biomethane, the size of the industry would be quite significant. The feedstock challenge to meet that kind of continuous demand of 30 petajoules per annum, I'm, I'm not sure the developers are probably better to answer that, but I'm, I'm going to hazard to guess that it's not going to sit well within our risk profile. I mean, the problem with feedstock is actually an issue not just for biomethane or for hydrogen it actually is a bit of an issue for natural gas itself um, and others here will be in incredibly well versed on that issue as well as finding that much gas in a market is, is going to be incredibly um, challenging but I think biomethane just from a supply security risk perspective I think it'd be too big a pill to swallow. Anyone else? Oh yeah, over there. Hi, um, just a quick question, uh, Pinonite Real Assets. Uh, question for, I guess, primarily Mike and Jared. As developers, uh, the green gas certification is clearly a, it's a great step forward, but for that to really be effective in uh, getting finance in to develop projects, you've got to develop liquidity in that market. Um, so I'm keen to get your thoughts in terms of going from a pilot to uh, like a market where there's trading liquidity and it's a recognized instrument in terms of some of the key next steps that have to happen in that process um, what would you say they are well you know I think it's great to have the certification up and running people for some reason had to understand that you could be connected to supply by a shared infrastructure so that's been done so I think that's the social license piece so that's you know that's got got the and then there's that the voluntary demand that's that, that's opened up and, and and we have found as I said a small uh, customers that are you know happy to to wear that um, that that certification and, and report it separately. 
But I think it, the, uh, you know, as the profile of of that certification increases, I, it should be an informant to a guarantee of origin at the federal level. Um, you know, there's already work done on a guarantee of origin for hydrogen. It's not too much of a, a step to move it to biomethane. Uh, I think we're ready as a, an industry with proven tech, demand, infrastructure to make the case about this is what the market now needs, this is what is actually going to get capital off the sidelines. Um, so I think, it, I think it is that. I think it's, it, it's Green Power's a stepping stone and Green Power can continue as, as a pathway, but just needs the recognition of, of a guarantee of origin and you know, effectively recognition of scope one reductions through a market-based mechanism. Yeah, I'll just I'll just touch quickly on the liquidity. I don't think I don't think the certificate market's going to have liquidity for some time. I think as part of any of these projects to achieve FID, those certificates need to be sold. So a lot of these projects are going to have prior to FID, or if a project's post FID, in general, those certificates are sold, on sold for five years more than likely. So I, I think it will be challenging to get that liquidity in the market for some time, and. I guess from our perspective, we already have quite a significant number of buyers, petajoules worth of buyers, and I, I am sure Manuel and Brad would also have the n a number of buyers that are getting in contact with them saying, can I buy some certificates? It's just, the market just isn't there yet. Now that supports a lot of the project development and hopefully in time we may see that. But again, the risk is too great to take a project without that additional benefit and having that market locked in. Anyone else? Any other questions from the audience? We've still got about 10 minutes if anyone wants to ask another one. I've got, I've got one actually, um, probably open it up to the panel. If we're talking about the barriers and, and Mike's just kind of touched on it, Jared's just kind of touched on it, but we talk about barriers to deployment. If, if you could make a wish and tomorrow that wish would come true, where would you start and, and what would you change to accelerate your part in this industry and, and, and just the biomethane industry in general? I guess for me, I'll go first. <clears throat> Just when it comes, everyone's worried about feedstock. So one of our products is carrots. There's no Australian that hasn't had access to a carrot in the last 50 years. <laughs> we put food on your table every day. Don't worry about your gas feedstock supply. If you pay for it, we'll grow it. <clears throat> That's, you know, the, the rural industry is extremely capable. Uh, extremely diverse. There's 9,000 separate individual producers out there just in our horticultural industry alone. <clears throat> as long as the framework's there and we can get paid, we, we, can, we can do that. The, the other one is um, there's a lot of policy that's not going to be written anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So we're in this pressured position where we have to sell it because if we want to build it, we've got an approval that doesn't last forever. So next year we need to be turning to trucks and engines. We've just chosen that pathway. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to find your own solutions. Uh, Accus and credits and certificates, whatever ends up, they might sit on the balance sheet for a little while. You're just going to have to tolerate that. Um, there's very sophisticated investment available, but it's overseas. People that know and understand it, they're willing to take long bets. There's, we're finding more equity available in agriculture that's moving into new energy than there is in energy moving into agriculture. So we're not, we don't see that as a barrier. So it's just about, we've just got to be a bit patient and find our own solutions. Thanks. Uh, I think I, I touched on it um, earlier when I was speaking, but I think from our point of view, um, I don't know, we've, we've heard it over and over, and I, I'm probably just going to repeat something that we've, we've heard all day today, but that recognition for renewable gas uh, as a, you know, a way to reduce scope one emissions is, is key. And you know, it's a great first step, and, and Green Power have done a, a great job to set up a certification scheme. Um, but the recognition of those certificates and the recognition of the renewable gas, um, it, you know, I think will, uh, has the potential to really drive uh, demand for renewable gas, which could accelerate the, the development of the industry. I might not get out of Canberra, but a carbon price? <laughs> You're not getting out of Canberra. <laughs> yeah, and, and just one thing from me is just sensible conversation about an energy system.
an energy system transition. I mean, we, you know, the constant over-focus on electrification and hydrogen, where we should be having a broad discussion about our whole energy system transitioning and each energy vector playing to their competitive role. Mm -hmm. Great. What do we think? Should we get an early? I oh, know we've got one over here. Great. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Mary Lavelle. I'm from SA Government Energy and Mining. I've been coming to these for what's probably since 2016, and I think the last couple of years, are especially yesterday and today, I've got hope in my heart <laughs> about this industry and how it's moving forward. And Bionchi Australia, obviously, done a great job over the last few years. I think my question is for Zal uh, today, his presentation. Uh, we saw how it's working in a market where they've got all the policy drivers and they've got all the market drivers. They've got everything that everyone here is asking for. My question is that if that, ha what would be the lag time between us getting that and us having a really robust industry? Who wants to take that one? Uh, Honestly, I, I don't think there's enough biogas producers and biogas developers, so I think there would be time. But with policy shift and regulatory shift comes equity investment. You've got a lot of overseas invest investors that are very, very smart in this market. They know how to play, they know how to set it up. I think given that it's so well developed internationally, it's not like a hydrogen industry, for instance, where you're pushing an emerging market around the world at the same time. You've got a well-developed industry with experts around the world that have 15 years of biogas to biomethane or, or CNG. It, it will create a market and it will ramp up very, very quickly. We don't have enough now, but I do believe with that policy shift. And again, we're in a perfect environment where we can look internationally and say, well, what did work? What actually didn't work? What did work? And what worked favourably and what impacted consumers the most? Yes, we have a cost of living crisis, but Internationally, what has worked? Is it a tax incentive? Is it, is it a feed-in tariff? Like, we can make that analysis, and we've done it already. So I think that's really important, and it will bring the investment and the expertise to deliver. Yeah, I was just gonna echo that. I mean, proven tech, we're, we're a developer, we're not the only developer, but we're leveraging international yeah, technology providers and leveraging our own domestic EPC, EPC capability. So it, it'd probably be similar to you know, being laggards in probably wind and solar, and then, you know, when that market moves, you can move relatively quickly. Um, so, yeah, I, I think right policy selection, we'd actually have some competitive advantages of being late, like Jared said, by being laggard, it actually helps us to go, all right, we didn't have to go through the European lesson learned of small scale uh, biogas to power. We've got cheaper ways of making electricity. We can go straight to scale. The value is in molecules. Let's get them to scale, let's target in and around gas infrastructure or and or transport, CNG, you know, where, wherever it's going to make highest value contribution to energy transition, so. I think I'll just add to that is that um, you, in Australia, we do have, uh, you know, one of the best, uh, most skilled and developed um, gas industries in the world as well. And we've got a proven track record on delivering um, gas projects. Uh, and, you know, so I think, uh, you, th there is a workforce and a, a, a skill. Um, while we, there's a risk, that, like, as I touched on, that that um, yeah, we we need to continue that for the future. But we we do have the deployment for it ready now. When when we started, we we had to write our own end of waste code with the state government. Um, we couldn't wait for an industry body to try it because it's really hard. So we found some pathways to get things done. Um, so with partnerships and influence, um, you know, you work out what you want first and, and you, can, you can get it done. We, we, a feedback from Queensland Government was this is the most complex approval process they've ever done for one project because we were converting rural land to industrial land end of waste code, bioenergy facility, you know, the list goes on, they can be, keep complaining. But <coughs> you can do it. Um, the financial investment decision or FID, you know, we just said, for us it's like, are we going to build it? So you do have to lean in, and I guess ARENA are here, that's what they're for, 
you de-risk it. You know, Australia has a different way of doing it. There's not going to be a subsidy. So it's like, well, give us some free money. We'll go and find some other money. We'll put some in. You have to find your own solutions. But I think um, with people like Blue Scope on a panel, if you can articulate clearly what you want, you will get it done. Um, it just needs a bit more oomph and a few more partnerships and Shahana to keep going and not run out of energy. <laughs> I think we're years away, um, years. And Richard, you, you have a lot of carrots, but I'm, unfortunately the government's got a lot of sticks. Um, <laughs> and big business is kind of getting beaten continuously. And uh, maybe the point that I didn't articulate very well is every dollar that comes to cost sits as a loss of profitability. We do not have the ability to pass the cost through to the business, we, uh, through to our customers. We have incredibly fierce international competition through Chinese steelmakers who are flooding markets um, with cheap product and we are in a constant battle for competition. And so until cost competitiveness starts to really be a focus, I don't think we're going, it's going to take us years. And I suppose the challenge I would put out is, as I've mentioned before, everybody has to curb their enthusiasm in terms of what they, the typical returns that they might want to try and lift up a nascent industry. You might have an investment rate of return of 20%. You're not going to get 20% to start lifting up an industry. Because all that does is you cascade all of that cost down to the end user and then you tell me, hey, here's the price. It's double, but it's a good product. Well, that's great, but I think we all have to start working on the financials and making sure that we don't just cascade the impact to the end user. If we do, that's what will take a long time. That's why hydrogen's not going to lift up because everybody wants the same return. I don't know, maybe there's some renewable energy developers here as well in wind and solar but all their costs have gone up recently. And in the conversations I have with them, they all say, well, inflation has risen, EPC contractor prices have gone up, supply chain's gone up, steel prices have gone up. And so our project's more expensive. Unfortunately, our investment rate of return is still the same. Uh, and as a result, you're gonna have to pay more. Um, my, my answer is swift and it's consistent, which is no thanks. Um, so I, I'm not in the, we're not a charity, right? We're a for-profit business. We need to make sure that we are picking the most cost efficient outcome. I don't, that, I don't interpret that as zero cost. I'm just saying I think everybody through the chain needs to probably do their part. Can I ask a question? Heather, what's your opinion? I guess you, you're, you've built a facility. Mm, yeah. How, well, how quickly can you ramp up? Well, I, I think that my comment on that was that we've got all of this technology that we've learned from from Europe, but the challenge was bringing it here. You can't plug a European thing into an Australian socket, you know, just to be really, um, you know, just to make that sort of uh, analogy. But I think that understanding compliance, understanding what we need to do in Australia, we know how to do it. We know how to make things compliant here. There's a lot of developers that understand the complex sort of compliance environment in Australia and the things that can go wrong when you import things from overseas. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're from, from our perspective, I mean, we've, we've built one, we've, we've nearly built two. Um, so we're ready to go. Yeah, I think that might be time, everybody. Thank you to our panel. Thanks everyone for sticking it out. <laughs>